Well, we've been working our way through chapters 1 to 5 of the book of Luke as part of a wider series. Now, this section we are calling Beginnings because here Luke shows us the beginnings of Jesus' life and ministry. Now, last time in chapter 4 we looked at the basis of Jesus' ministry, which we saw was firmly rooted in his relationship uh, that, that he had with God the Father which is where, of course, our own basis for living needs to be and needs to be rooted in him. Now, as we look at Luke 5, we see that Jesus' mission is to make brothers and sisters also who will become part of God's family. And as we think about them, we're going to ask what it takes for us to be made brothers and sisters and find out what this needs from us. Now, when my dad was at work, he belonged to a trade union. And our family used to laugh at the letters that he received from Union HQ, which began, Dear Brother Moss. Now, to us as a family, it seemed very odd. On one hand, it made him sound like a monk, which he certainly wasn't. And on the other hand, there was no real personal relationship between him and the people who were writing to him. Now he liked and he respected the union leader, a man called Frank Chapel, but he would never have sat down, he would never have walked in, sat down and had a cup of tea and a chat with him because he didn't know him. You see, brother and sister is the language of family. And God's intention for his people is that we should all be part of his family. Now family is founded on personal relationships. And our focus this morning is on the family that God wants us to be and the family that he is forming through Jesus, each member of which has a personal relationship with him. This is the family that shows God's intentions as they love and care for one another and they have a desire that all should do well together. This is the family over which God is the head. So as we look then at Luke chapter 5, we're going to see how Jesus begins to draw God's family together. And we're going to discover what Jesus did then is still very relevant for us today. Now just by way of explanation, I'm going to use brothers as a shorthand for brothers and sisters, which is a bit of a mouthful. But the same points apply whether you're a man or a woman. Uh, but... But Jesus, in this chapter, deals exclusively with men. Oh, that's the, those are the, the main characters that Luke brings out for us. So if you have your, if you have your Bibles open uh, at Luke 5, then this is going to be the, the sort of uh, a hasty tour um, throughout. So, first of all then, in verses 1 to 11, we discover that brothers are personally chosen and called for salvation and to do a specific work for God. Well, Luke begins this section by setting the scene for us at the Lake of Gennesaret, which is otherwise known as the Sea of Galilee, where Jesus was teaching and people were crowding round him and listening to the word of God. Now this was a, a, a fishing area of course with apparently between 18 to 25 species of fish in the lake. So it's no surprise that Jesus is near fishing boats at the water's edge as the fishermen are there washing the nets. And Jesus gets into a boat belonging to Simon, that is Simon Peter. And he asks him to push the boats out a little way from the shore. Now Simon does this and, and, and Jesus sits down, which was the way in which people expected him to teach them, and he taught them from the boat. Now in doing these things, Simon had served God and so Jesus rewards him. He instructs him to put out into deep water and let down the nets for a catch. Now, although Simon tells Jesus that he and his colleagues have worked all night and caught nothing. He goes on to say, but because you say so, 
I will let down the nets. So why would an experienced fisherman take the advice of a religious teacher whose only previous experience had been as a carpenter? The only reasonable answer can be that Simon's heart had already been touched by the ministry of Jesus as he proclaimed the word of God. Simon's obedience in letting down the nets then is at the very least an outward sign that he sees that God is with this teacher. Now again we see that obedience to Jesus' word means blessing. Both Simon's boat and that of James and John were so full that they're in danger of sinking. This is the lavishness, the greatness of God's blessing. But what is striking is Simon Peter's reaction to what has just happened. Just like his colleagues, he's astonished at what's, as what has happened, but he says to Jesus, Go away from me, Lord, I am. I'm a sinful man. Peter understood fishing. He knew that what had just happened should not have happened. Peter knew this was a miracle. God's great grace and goodness had been poured out onto him by Jesus. And he knew that he in no way deserved it. He had spiritually realised that Jesus was God and responded in the only way he could. But Jesus has a plan and a purpose for these fishermen. He says, don't be afraid. From now on, you will catch men. And they pull their boats up onto the shore, leave everything and follow him. When Jesus calls... Obedience is our only option. These men had now become brothers because they had been chosen by him and called to work for him. Now the next instance is in verses 12 to 16. And that shows us that in Jesus' mission to make God's family, that brothers are cleansed. Now a man comes to Jesus and he's covered in leprosy and makes an extraordinary statement. Luke tells us, when he saw Jesus, he fell with his face to the ground and begged him, Lord, if you are willing, you can make me clean. Now that's quite astonishing. Here is a man who is full of a dreadful skin disease and leprosy could mean more, more than one particular disease. It's a dreadful skin disease. And because of it, he's an outcast from society. But he's heard of Jesus and has faith that the power of God is at work in him. He knows that Jesus is able to heal him, but he doesn't presume that Jesus will. Why should the grace of God be given to him, like Simon Peter? He has done nothing to deserve it. But Jesus responds to the faith of this man. I am willing, he says, and gives the word of instruction, be clean. Immediately this dreadful skin disease leaves the man. What's important now is that Jesus tells the man to obey God's law by going to the priest and offering the sacrifice to God that was required for cleansing. Now that whole process is described in Leviticus chapter 14. And it's clear that the process not only deals with the uncleanness of the physical skin disease, but also with spiritual uncleanness. Now, in a real sense, Jesus has already dealt with both the physical and the spiritual disease. But now, there is to be the outward demonstration of the inward reality, as well as the important obedience to God's law, as the man goes to the priest to be declared clean, so the priest can confirm it. 
Now, although Jesus told this man not to tell anyone what he'd done for him, it was something, of course, that could not be hidden. Jesus wanted people to hear God's message, but he didn't seek adulation or popularity for himself. That's why when crowds of people came to hear him and be healed, he often withdrew to lonely places and prayed. Jesus understands that the greater the crowds, the, the, the greater his need to retain, to maintain the basis of his ministry. And he does this by taking time with his father to ensure that he remains faithful in his mission. Now Luke moves us then on to a new scenario in verses 17 to 26. And it's an important story because it actually provides us with the glue that holds the whole chapter together. It, because it applies actually to every episode that we find here. And this is, and the lesson from this is that brothers are helpless to save themselves. So we're going to read together now uh, Luke, Luke 5 and we're going to read verses 17 down to 26, this, this section, Luke chapter 5, verses 17 to 26. One day, as Jesus was teaching, Pharisees and teachers of the law, who had come from every village of Galilee and from Judea and Jerusalem, were sitting there. And the power of the Lord was present for him to heal the sick. Some men came carrying a paralytic on a mat and tried to take him into the house to lay him before Jesus. When they could not find a way to do this because of the crowd, they went up on the roof and lowered him on his mat through the tiles in the middle of the crowd, right in front of Jesus. When Jesus saw their faith, he said, Friend, your sins are forgiven. The Pharisees and the teachers of the law began thinking to themselves, Who is this fellow who speaks blasphemy? Who can forgive sins but God alone? Jesus knew what they were thinking and asked, Why are you thinking these things in your hearts? Which is easier, to say your sins are forgiven or to say get up and walk? But that you may know that the Son of Man has an authority on earth to forgive sins. He said to the paralyzed man, I tell you, get up, take your mat and go home. Immediately he stood up in front of them, took what he'd been lying on and went home praising God. Everyone was amazed and gave praise to God. They were filled with awe and said, we have seen remarkable things today. So what we have then is Jesus again teaching, but present now are the Pharisees and teachers of the law who come from every village of Galilee and Judea. Now these were devoutly religious people, the unofficial religious leaders of the people who were there to see what this teacher, Jesus, was all about. Now these religious people believed that by keeping God's law to the best of their ability that they would be made right with God. And they were so anxious about not breaking God's law that they added rules and regulations so that they would not, as they thought, come close to it. They made every effort to keep them. They were actually respected by the Jewish people for it. But keeping God's law for them had become something that was done more for outward show than it was to be inwardly right with him. Now as Jesus is busy teaching, Luke also draws our, to our attention that the power of the Lord was present for him to heal the sick. This is good news for a paralysed man who wants to be healed. There's nothing that he can do to get to Jesus. So he has to be brought to the house where Jesus is by others. When they arrive, he, he finds that there's nothing that he can do to get inside the house. To, uh, an access to Jesus. 
So the way has to be made for him. Because the man has faith that Jesus can heal him. So the men took the paralyzed man up on the roof and lowered him on his mat through the tiles into the middle of the crowd, right in front of Jesus. Now it's important that we just pause here for a moment so that we can stress the important point that the man who was paralysed could not come to Jesus personally. He was totally helpless. Again, Luke is making the point to us that this man's paralysis is an outward picture of the inward reality of everyone. And the reality of our hearts is not what the Pharisees would tell us. There is nothing that we can do to make us right with God. We are spiritually paralysed because of our sin. That we push God out of the centre of our lives so that we can take his place there. And it's not until God has dealt with that sin that we can actually live to please him. That's why when Jesus is confronted by this paralysed man coming through the roof, he gives the surprising response of, Friend, your sins are forgiven. Now in doing that, Jesus has dealt with actually what's the key problem. Not this man's physical problem with his limbs, but the, but of the spiritual problem of his right standing before God. And in forgiving sins, Jesus now opens the way for this man to live, to follow God's path for his life. Now the Pharisees and the teachers of the law recognise that there's an issue here. They think to themselves that Jesus is guilty of blasphemy. The nub of the issue is this, who can forgive sins but God alone? If Jesus were any other man, they would have been correct. But they are not here. Jesus challenges them because he knows what they're thinking. He says, which is easier? To say your sins are forgiven? Or to say get up and walk? Now in one sense, the first is easier than the second since there's no immediate evidence of anything ha having happened when you say it. But Jesus' point is really that to say your sins are forgiven uh, is the hardest thing, because you need the power to put it into effect for it really to happen. But now, Jesus is going to prove that God has given him the power and the authority to break the paralysis of sin as he physically heals the man in front of him. He says to him, I tell you, get up, take your mat and go home. The response to Jesus' command is immediate. The man got up, took what he'd been lying on and went home praising God. Those who were present were amazed and praised God for what he had done through Jesus. So through this miracle then, Jesus has demonstrated that he is God. As this healing reveals the outward sign of the inward reality. That Jesus has the personal power to heal those paralysed by sin. Jesus has set this man free spiritually as well as physically. It's therefore a powerful demonstration to all who are present, but particularly the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, that he was not committing blasphemy, but that he really was God. But there was more that needed to be demonstrated to the Pharisees and the teachers of the law. And these things are important for us to know as well. And the, the key points in Luke's next section, verses 27 to 31, is that brothers are sinners saved. The section begins with Jesus seeing a tax collector called Levi, or Matthew as we otherwise know him, and calling this man to follow him. 
Levi got up, left everything, and followed him. Levi then holds a great banquet for Jesus at his house as an outward demonstration of his inward love for Jesus. He had also invited a large crowd of tax collectors and others to this, no doubt to meet with Jesus too. But the Pharisees and the teachers of the law who had not been invited were unimpressed. They complained to the disciples and said, why do you eat with tax collectors and sinners? They had a point, they thought, after all. They'd been following all these rules and regulations so that they would be right with God. Surely they were worthy of time with Jesus rather than tax collectors and others who were living lives beyond the pale. Surely they were worthy of salvation and not these sinners. Jesus doesn't give the disciples an opportunity to answer. Instead he tells these religious people, it is not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. Now that's a vital answer. The mission that God the Father had sent his only son to perform was to rescue his people from their sin and the consequences they faced because of it. But we know that if someone gets into trouble on the cliffs here, the Coast Guard and the RNLI will go to them, get them off, and get them back into safety. And this is what Jesus is, is effectively doing here. He's come to bring into God's family those who are sinners, those who are in danger of God's judgment. And to do that, he needs to meet with them so that they can be rescued. Brothers and sisters in Jesus were once sinners who have been saved by him. Now this leads us nicely into the final section in verses 33 to 39 where we see that brothers are rejoicing because Jesus is with them. <clears throat> now the section continues on from Levi's banquet. And the Pharisees and teachers of the law complaining about the behaviour of Jesus' disciples. They say, John's disciples often fast and pray, and so do the disciples of the Pharisees. But yours go on eating and drinking. Mm -hmm. Of course, what's implied by that criticism is, is that the really spiritual disciples were those of John the Baptist and the Pharisees, with their religious observance of fasting. Yours, Jesus, they're saying, are really not up to scratch. Jesus' response to that is to use a picture of a wedding banquet where he is the bridegroom. Now, a wedding, of course, is a joyful occasion. And those who are wedding guests, in this case the picture is, is of his disciples, are rejoicing because the bridegroom is with them. Jesus says that this won't always be the case. And there'll be times when they will fast, but now is not the time. He then goes on to tell a parable. And a parable, as Jesus told them, is a story with a, bit, a bigger meaning about God and what that means for us. And in the first part, Jesus says that you don't patch up an old garment with cloth that you've cut out of a new one. He then emphasises the point by talking about putting new wine into old wineskins. Now, the skin from a goat could be taken and made into a container for holding wine. A new wineskin had plenty of stretch and give in it, which would allow it to store new wine and the weight of the liquid. But if the wine was poured into an old skin, which had less give, was more brittle, then that would be ruined. It would fall apart it would be destroyed and the wine would be wasted. Jesus' final comment in verse 39 essentially says that there are those who, won't want to try, who don't want to try anything new, but they are content to go on drinking the, 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 the old wine and go on in the old ways. Now, the bigger meaning about God that Jesus 
He's directing the Pharisees and the teachers of the law to here, and has said for our benefit, is that through him, God is doing something new. Jesus, you see, hadn't just come simply to patch up the religion of the Jews, to be that new patch on old clothes, to get them to do more religious things so that God would be pleased with them. He was God's new wine, which the old skins of Judaism would not be able to contain. There'd always be those who rejected him, who preferred to live in the old ways. But God had revealed something of the reality of who he was to his disciples. And they were rejoicing because of him. To rejoice because Jesus was with them was the right response. This morning then we've been thinking about God's true family and what each family member has in common. Now of course from Luke 5, Jesus was going to go on and die so that he could become the older brother of the family of many brothers and sisters. But the lessons here hold true, particularly, particularly because of this. So we've learned that brothers and sisters are chosen and called personally by Jesus. We've learned that they are cleansed by him. We, we've heard that they've been, they are helpless to save themselves, that they are sinners saved, and that brothers and sisters in Jesus are rejoicing because Jesus is with them. Now that Jesus has done these things is wonderful news for everyone. But if you've never put your trust in Jesus before, this is particularly wonderful news for you. There is a way for you to be made right with God and having a real relationship with him. And as sin rejects God's rule in our lives, then we are separated from him by a gap that we just can't bridge. It doesn't matter how religious we are. God wants us to do something different, to be made right with him. And God has provided for us a way to do that in Jesus. Because sin makes us helpless to restore our relationship with him. That's why Jesus, the pure and the perfect son of God, suffered and died on a cross. So that the price that God demanded we pay for our sin could be paid once and for all as Jesus took the punishment on himself that we deserve. On the third day Jesus rose from the dead showing us that our new life was now in him for anyone who trusts and follows him. And these things can be yours if you trust in Jesus as God's way to make you right with him. Whatever your past is, Jesus promises to save and cleanse you from it, so that you have a new life and a new hope for today and into the future as you follow him. It's a hope that because Jesus will now be personally with you, day by day, that will help you to rejoice in him through all the circumstances of life. Jesus is personally calling you to trust and to follow him today. Are you going to follow him? I trust that you do. Well as Christians all the things that we've been thinking about this morning are very important as they're the things that we hold in common as brothers and sisters in Christ and as we continue to reflect on them Help us to show our family likeness to the Lord Jesus himself. First of all, we should be encouraged and be given great assurance and confidence that as Christians we have been chosen and called by God personally. Our salvation has absolutely nothing to do with us and absolutely everything to do with him. This is still true 
when we struggle through, our, through whatever the storms of life may throw at us, as we seek to keep our focus on Jesus and walk with him day by day, he will never let us go. Secondly, we are to rely on Jesus alone in our Christian lives as the power and strength we have to fulfil his calling comes from him alone. Thirdly, we should be able to rejoice throughout our life because we have the personal presence of Jesus with us through the Holy Spirit as he continues to work in us for God's glory. Now these things are also essential as everything we've thought about applies not, not just to individuals as family members but to us as a whole church family. And as we reflect that we're all sinners who've been saved by God's grace in Jesus and that we were all helpless to be made right with God until Jesus rescued us, it should remind us that there is nothing about any of us that makes us any better than anyone else. The Apostle Paul reminds us of what our response to Jesus' call on our lives should look like to our brothers and sisters in him. Be completely humble and gentle. Be patient, bearing with one another in love. Make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. It's important to remember that a vital part of our testimony to the wider world is the unity of the fellowship. That is the way in which we love one another and work together with Jesus as our focus. We are brothers and sisters in Christ. We are part of his family. He is personally present with us and this is what our unity shows. We are God's family and we know that we need to show his family values to one another and to the wider watching world so that our lives match up to the good news we are proclaiming. As we do these things, we not only encourage our brothers and sisters, but we also reveal our family likeness to Jesus to those around us. And as others witness this, God will use it so that we are able to give a reason for the hope that we have. Well, may God help us to take these things to heart. And as individuals and as a fellowship, May we know God's presence and power enabling us to faithfully bear testimony to the wonderful salvation that he has given us and wants to give to others too.